Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. There's probably not a more important industry in Minnesota than agriculture, and yet it seems that as we're talking around our communities, we're running into uh, situations where we don't see people who are involved in agriculture as much, whereas at one time, almost every family in a rural community had somebody who was working on a farm or owned a farm or had something to do with an agricultural business. Actually, agriculture is not becoming less important in Minnesota, it's becoming more important. It's just that it's changing so drastically through technology and other things that it's just a different look, a different feel. So today we're going to be talking about a, a fairly new concept in Minnesota called ag-centric. And we're going to talk about what ag-centric is and we're going to talk a little bit about the changing technology of agriculture. And my guest today is Keith Olander, who is the director of ag culture, it's ag-centric which is a term we'll explain a little bit. He's also the Dean of Agriculture at Central Lakes College. Welcome aboard. Thanks, Ray, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Nice to have you here. Uh, let's first of all just talk about what does it mean, ag-centric, what are you talking about? It is a center of excellence, and I know that gets to be kind of uh, just a term you know, in the air, but um, if we think about in the Minnesota State College and University System, there are 23 campuses, or I'm sorry, 31 campuses and 23 colleges. And within that, there are eight centers of excellence and they're focused within industries. So we have healthcare and manufacturing and, and down the road and agriculture, obviously one of those industries. Within agriculture, we have two centers of excellence, one located out of Mankato and they're the, south, the Southern Center. And then we are considered kind of that Northern Center, if you will, based out of Central Lakes. Uh, we have gone through kind of a marketing uh, blitz, if you will, through our opening now in the last year and termed ourselves ag-centric. And really that term to be, so you want a term that is a little bit catchy with that, but at the same time keeps that focus on agriculture. And so if we're centered on agriculture and what that means in terms of workforce all the way up through the industry is really where we want to be. So when you say centers of excellence, and I do ha have a familiarity with what that is, but for our viewers who may not, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about merging colleges uh, that all had standalone programs at one time to make them more uh, cost effective, more efficient in how they're doing business together. And so there are centers of excellence in the state, as you said, through a number of different areas, healthcare being another example. Yeah. So in your role, I would assume you work on different campuses. You don't just work at Central Lakes College. Absolutely. In uh, Eggcentric, there are th currently three schools under partnership. So there is uh, Northland Community College up at Thief River and East Grand Forks, and then Ridgewater College, which is campused at Wilmer and Hutchinson. And they're paired with Central Lakes College at Staples and Brainerd then. And so it's that whole idea of a collaboration model. And it actually stemmed out of legislation coming from 2005, which was 10 years ago. And at that time, they originated four centers uh, based over in the manufacturing, healthcare, and transportation sectors, and then later brought in agriculture culture uh, just as you said in your opening about the importance of agriculture and it's uh, really the uh, idea of people being very knowledgeable of their food source and on the other side developing workforce for the industry and having those needs out there so, so part of our mission so do focus. you have a, a, a strong focus on getting students into the program in these colleges absolutely absolutely um, we are looking at a couple different tracks on that so as a traditional college setting, if you think of the different agriculture colleges and each of us out trying to maybe to compete for the same students, and we want to think of you know, those traditional farm kids, if we will, um, those numbers are dwindling. And we know that just because you know, less than 2% of our population farms. But at the same time, our population continues to grow. You know, we're going to be up at 9 billion here in a few years, in about 25 years. And we've got to feed that population. So we need a workforce. And so that means that we're actually beginning to look at non-traditional students, uh, students who really have no idea or, or very limited ideas of where their food source is uh, beyond the grocery store and we're looking at how do we attract some of those students into agriculture because we need to have a full system from you know if I can consider farm to fork if you will all the way through that system and so one of our focuses in ag centric and the centers as a whole is how do we bring students into the college programs and move them on to industry and be responsive to industry demand especially as technology continues to move forward. I, I know in the having been in the college system myself that there's always been a a focus and a lot of pressure to maintain student 
enrollments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, when you have a center of excellence and you're working with two other campuses besides Central Lakes, can you count that core as, as your total students then, or do you still do it campus by campus? Obviously, each campus, you know, financially, they have to maintain their own and be responsible or, or accountable to their own in terms of maintaining numbers within the classes. But as a core, we start to look at, so when we went to National FFA Convention, there were 65,000 high school students there, and we're recruiting in and making them aware of some of the career possibilities. We aren't so concerned about what campus that we're promoting within that. We're trying to align what is your interest and how do we fit that into a career pathway and really defining that career pathway for them as to the coursework and what that might look like. Because again, our students aren't necessarily familiar with uh, common tracks within agriculture and the, the coursework involved with that. On the other hand, one of the things that we're going to be initiating is how do we develop degrees where a student may be located out of our state and be able to take coursework from each of the varied colleges and come out with a mutual degree that would satisfy an industry need as well. So we're moving so, that forward. So, um, how long has this Center of Excellence been in operation? Eggcentric is the baby of the bunch. Uh, oh, okay. We actually, uh, if I would go back to July of 2014, was really our official uh, initiation from a council perspective. And back in February at the Department of Agriculture is where we officially went public and launched the Eggcentric name and moved that forward. So we are certainly the youngest. The other agricultural centers about a year ahead of us. So the agriculture centers as a whole really are young in, in their inception. And I, I know historically uh, Central Lakes College has worked a lot with the University of Minnesota. Yep. They still do research, I believe, because of the sand plain yes. area that we're here in yes. this part of the state. Do you still do a lot of work through your centers of excellence with the University of Minnesota? Absolutely. Uh, if we look at what I would consider the assets, the educational assets, Ridgewater really has one of the larger secondary, post-secondary programs with students actually on campus uh, in coursework. Uh, Northland, their asset, if I could use that term up there, is in aviation or aerospace. And some of the drone work that's going on, they're kind of leading that charge. And at Central Lakes, yeah, we operate about 1,500 acres of research and demonstration. Uh, multiple research companies, both public and private. University of Minnesota is certainly tied into that. Um, in those pieces, the variety of trials pieces we just sent out in terms of our corporate partners and where we're working there. And then this whole idea of natural resources. How do we, as we do in the irrigation world, how are we mitigating irrigation use um, from the standpoint of just trying to cut down use and then be more efficient on the other side? And then, of course, below ground, how are we watching the underground movements of water as it relates to some of the leaching that may be occurring from nitrates? So I, I think you had, did you get a grant uh, a while back, I, I can't remember for sure. We have several that we work with, absolutely. And, and what, yep. are, what are the yep. grants, what are the intentions of the grants? Um, we have anything ranging from some of the energy pieces and the biomass, all right? We had a next-gen grant that we've just brought to completion here about 10 months ago, and that was focused on alternative forms of energy. And we still had that progress moving along, just not under the form of a next-gen grant for that. So we were looking at, uh, for example, canola. Using, we think of canola oil as when we're out on the store shelf, but we can also run that through a diesel engine. And so we have that in operation and active there. In the area of biomass, uh, Miscanthus is a what called grass that comes to mind, but this whole idea of biomass and how do we use biomass as alternative forms of energy um, for those pieces, so we had those things coming along. Most recently, we've got a couple of grants working, one in the area of the UAS, or Unmanned Aerial Services, or Systems, um, for that, and how do we have a curriculum that's ready to go. We know that as FAA moves along with their regulations, we think in 2018 they'll be official. We have an umbrella um, coverage right now, or permit to fly, but we need to be teaching our youth about the applications in that. And of course, that spans a lot of industry. Agriculture is typically your leader in new technologies. We've seen that in the whole GPS or global positioning systems thing as that came out a number of years ago. And we know that drones are gonna be applied probably one of the earliest uh, adapters, if you will, as an industry. And so that's one of our latest ones now is this initiative funds to have uh, use of UAS curriculum, uh, really applications and on the ground and training. And then again, we go back to this whole idea of data. We create a lot of data in agriculture, but how do we really utilize that data to make decisions? We'll come back to that because I think the technology you're working in is mind boggling. It really is. Um, there are a number of uh, international organizations that are saying, for the most part, we are out of land for agriculture. Mm -hmm without going into forests, uh, which we have done in Minnesota mm -hmm. here recently. Mm -hmm. So the emphasis is not going to be on developing more agricultural land. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be on developing 
more efficient ways of being uh, in the agricultural yep. business, and that's one of the things you're doing. Uh, just one other question about your center of excellence. Do you have a board that you work with then, or how, how, do, you, how do you determine policy? Yep, so we have from the colleges representatives, both deans you know, of the colleges as mm -hmm. well as instructors that make up a council. Uh, all three presidents then are a part of that advisory piece so that that council meets quarterly and makes those decisions for those internal operations, if you will. But we also have an advisory council that meets annually and provides us guidance and they're heavily embedded with industry. Um, and then a lot of uh, service areas, so we get into NRCS and DNR and those folks, so that they're providing on the natural resources side uh, from a public perspective. So we have those, basically those two counts, the internal operations and then that advisory piece that says you need to be looking in these particular sectors for career areas to service, um, or maybe some areas of pullback, if you will. So it's just a matter that we are current with today's technology and applications. I remember it wasn't that long ago that when a farmer got 100 bushels of corn an acre, mm -hmm. that was a big deal. Yeah. That was a money maker. What are you looking at now for ranges? Um, we peaked out at the farm locally here uh, over 200. We were 213, 214 with a lot of yield spots on that. You know, in today's combines, we track it very specific. Right, almost to the exactly. square foot, don't you? Almost by the size of the table, the three right. by three square that we're tracking those out uh, for that. But to average now 170, 180 is not that big. Obviously, we had a good year productively, but a 100 bushel yield right now is a very poor yield. Isn't that amazing? Yep, it is it really amazing. Is. Yep. yep, and it really goes back to those scientists from a genetic standpoint, and now we're moving into that soil biologic health. So how do we have that full cycle to generate that food cycle and to do that? Because as you're right, there is no more land, so we've got to take care of the resources we have and yet continue to, to increase our productivity. So the ag-centric movement is focusing on education, mm -hmm. trying to get people to understand the value of, of agriculture, but also the opportunities in agriculture. Yep. So you're trying to move into some of the non-traditional students uh, yes. to, and non-traditional students, could you help define what that means typically? Yeah, a non-traditional student, you know, we think of the, in rural Minnesota, you have students that are maybe they live on a farm or they're at least associated in some way. They have a relative on a farm or they've had some sort of experience. In other words, they've actually been maybe in contact with an animal or they've been out in a field. And we, we take that for granted sometimes in our area, but that's not a very common setting if I were to go to a Humboldt uh, High School in St. Paul or something like that. So our non-traditional are those that are coming that really have an interest in agriculture and they think it's cool to be able to uh, grow with an animal or a plant, but they really don't have any background or experience in that. And so our educational systems, instead of assuming some of the background knowledge being there, that isn't there. And so now we've got to build that in really in the basics. I worked in the cities at one period in my life, this is a true story, I worked with a gentleman who in his late 40s who never personally saw a cow yeah. because he never got outside of the metropolitan area yeah. boundaries. Yeah. So there are a lot of people like that that haven't had those experiences. Right. Maybe they don't get to the state fair and go to the, to the barns where the animals are. So, yeah. so that education is very important because the uh, traditional things that we looked at in farming, baling hay by hand and all that hard work it's changed, hasn't it? Absolutely. Farming is Absolutely. totally different yep. now. Yep. Just talk a little bit about the technology that you're starting to, to work with in, in agriculture. Sure. So um, if we look at just some of the technology, everything is very site-specific when it comes to at least the cropping situation. And when I say that, typically we're talking every foot by foot. Um, is measured out. Sometimes when we're doing the soil sampling, then we're looking at a three by three square, which, you know, if you think about within your house, I mean, there's several squares within that, but we treat that square very individual, you know, um, as its own being so that it has its own soil type, its own nutrient need. Therefore, then it has its own plant count. So we variable the rate of seed across that. And then we're able to fly over either satellite or drone and then measure the vegetative index as we go through the growing season. Because during the season, depending upon what the weather situation is, the, the nutrient need of that plant is going to change and we want to be able to satisfy it. And then, of course, as we move to the end of the season and we get into harvest mode, now we also pick up the harvest pieces in that very small section of land and stitch that all together. And when we lay these layers of data over the top, we can make some pretty sound decisions. Obviously, there's some easy things we can show on data maps about what particular uh, brand you may be buying, all right? Um, 
or what genetic we want to bring into the mix, or is there a problem with the underlying soil health? And there's just things as we look at, um, you know, I use aphids, for example, in soybeans get to be an issue from year to year, but they're very, can be very spotty in that. Well, in the past, we've been just applicating across the field, and we are now able to applicate very specific regions of fields and treat certain symptoms. So if you get one area, there's a lot of aphids, yep. you would hit that harder than areas where there aren't any. And some we wouldn't treat at all. And the mm -hmm. same could be brought of, we think of nitrogen and what it could do to our groundwater. We do that based on soil type and need because we don't have to apply at the same levels across the field. So we're just getting very specific in that, uh, in that treatment. So that's good for growth, obviously, in production, but it's wonderful wins for the environment and what we can do in terms of maintaining a quality of life and then that whole biological soil health piece that comes in there as well. On the area of uh, livestock, let's just do, jump into the dairy world. Uh, we think of robotic milking. You know, I grew up milking cows and, and always wished that there would be a machine that would do it, and they do it now. Um, they know it comes in, the cows are acclimated to it. It's actually a better system than the human because the robot is consistent every time. Um, in terms of every function that that robot does, but it monitors that animal throughout. So we know uh, if she has health issues, uh, temperature, white blood cell count, anything like that is all being measured so that we can get that, and that's helping us also on the breeding side as well so that we're getting better at productivity throughout the barn. Wow. Um, just a really phenomenal setup in terms of we have robotic cleaning from manure and waste handling. We have robotics in the feeding. We know that if we feed a cow more often without going overboard and that's six to eight times a day, that's gonna help her in terms of her rumination piece, you know, um, be better and so she's better productivity. And then the comfort piece also, if you understand that the comfort from a hot spots in the barn in the summer or cold, we can monitor that much better because we get systems now, air systems in the barns that are completely controlled mechanically. So it's just a matter from a farmer's perspective of monitoring that. Uh, on that side. If we go to uh, where we're at on technology on the beef side and that sector, um, we have with the capacity of the drone where we're working is uh, heat sensory because the same thing there, we know that a cow's temp is right around that 101 to 102 degrees and if we have a cow or calf that's up at 105 or 106, we know we've got, a, we've got an issue of sickness. Before it was all an observation and in a beef herd setting where you're spread out over a Hard large area of land, exactly. Now, and we're not perfect at that yet, we're still working on that, but those are where the pieces are going with that. On the other side, if we get to the avian flu that came out with the turkeys or the hogs, we're also looking at the technologies more so in how do we isolate those uh, barns and keep them extremely clean you know, and, turn, and healthy. Uh, for that and so we're using again just this very site-specific technology with that as we move forward So listening to you you can see that when you have a student coming into ag now mm -hmm. It's becoming very technical extremely it's not just doing the manual labor that so many of us grew up doing right. on farms yeah. so when you uh, Look at I think you know it used to be probably an average farm was 240 acres mm -hmm. when I grew up as a kid, yeah. and a lot of people could make a living off a 240 right. acre farm. What what does it realistically take to to make a living off a farm today? Uh, when I worked as a farm business manager and we would have young farmers starting up, and you start looking at you know today's uh, expenses as a family, and let's just go there because I think that relates to everybody. But if we're going to if you're going to buy your own insurance and support a family on the insurance side, it's ten to twelve thousand dollars a year. You know, and then that food is another ten to twelve thousand dollars a year. So it's easy that we build into a forty, fifty thousand dollar a year family living. Well, now you start looking at the profitability that is quite minute within the cropping world. We usually wouldn't start anybody with less than a hundred dairy cows, or we wouldn't be less than two thousand acres of land. Wow! And but the technology helps us to do that. But it is—it's a different world. But it's hard to get a start if you don't it have is. the income to get into it. Like exactly. The way it used to yeah. be passed on down. Yeah. yeah, we used to. You know, dad may help you in a financial world or something like that, or a bank even with a small loan. But a lot of things that nowadays financially, it's such large dollar volumes that go on. Of course. Uh, with the weather doing what it will do to offset that, it, it's very risky business, and so it takes a lot of planning. And so a farmer nowadays doesn't, you know, we go back to this management perspective, education and experience is key, but it's more important that they surround themselves with a very valuable team of individuals that are specialized in their areas, because it does take that team approach to really maximize production, maintain the environment, 
uh, and bring a family through that. And we still have, you know, over 90% of our, 97% of our farms in the country are family owned. It's just the sizes have grown because the, the profit per unit of no matter what I'm talking about is just diminished. But it also keeps us the cheapest food source, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of the United States to any other country in the mm -hmm. world. Because we're still in that 10 to 11% of our income is spent on food, and that's, that's dramatically less. reasonable. You know, we've yeah. got countries as high as 50% of right. their income is spent on food. Right. The technology has evolved uh, so dramatically, people may not realize it, but th there are, with the GPS systems we have now, tractors can actually run on fields without people in them. Absolutely, and yes. And they've been doing yeah. that for a number of years, uh, even in the heavy equipment areas. Yep. Uh, they're running heavy equipment with no operator on site. Right, yeah. And, and you can visually watch it now with the systems we got. That's yes. just mind-boggling. It is. And it's sophisticated, yes. isn't it? I mean, it, it, it isn't something that just an average guy can sit down in a cab of a tractor for 10 minutes and learn how to do the GPS system. No, no. It's, it's fairly sophisticated. Yep. There's usually you're always going to run into, if I, I think of three different computers in operation. You know, you've got one that's working specific with the GPS and yield. You've got one that's running what I would consider the powertrain of the equipment. And then you've got one that's trying to merge the two. So you really need to be a technician going in. And if everything works perfect, then it's fine, in a couple hours time and some training we can get there. Your challenge gets to be in troubleshooting. Why is something not occurring the way it is? And understand if I'm gonna have a 20 row planter or 24 row planter and every row is computer, computer controlled to vary rate, it's rate across the field and seed select because we're now to a point where we seed select different genetics as we go across the field. That farmer has wow. to be able to manage that whole system or at least know where to get help in that. So yes, it's very technical. And it is certainly a, a situation now where if everything works, you do actually just press the button when you get to the lined up and auto steer takes over and it goes across the field and it monitors everything for you and maps it according to what the, in this case, the planting, the population would be. So through your centers of excellence, do you offer like an AS degree or AA degree? What is it that yeah. uh, students have options for to do? We've got multiple options in terms of we can do certificate settings, so it's very specific. Um, so the Precision Ag Equipment Technician Program, so really what that's looking at is a, it's a 10 to 12 month certificate, but it's just repairing some of the UAS equipment, so a drone really looking into that. We have the other side goes all the way up, uh, specifics within agribusiness, agronomy, those are two year degrees. And then we have the AS, which is for Associate of Science. So we're really looking at those that want to transfer then onto a four year. So we have articulations with the University of Minnesota, Southwest State, in Marshall, Crookston, uh, University of Minnesota, Crookston. And, and really we can transfer that out to NDSU or SDSU as well. Um, so that they have that full capacity. If a student really wants to come in and get technical, 10, 12 months, or if they actually want to go to a full bachelor's degree. Going back to uh, just the Central Lakes campus for a minute, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you've got going on? I know there's some grape business, you're looking yep. at grapes. Yep. What, are, what are some of the things you're doing there that, that area people could look at? Sure, so we had our field day this summer and went over very well. Um, local foods as a whole is becoming something of uh, a great amount of interest in the area. So just at Central Lakes we have uh, the VESTA program which is viticulture and analogy so it's that grape growing and wine making and the chemistry related to that. So we have an instructor, uh, he actually teaches nationally a lot of online stuff but we do have a local vineyard there, um, different testing and we have our own la uh, wine quality lab and we're actually doing wine quality assessments mm -hmm. for Minnesota grape growers uh, with that. Then we have specialty crops uh, instructor and he's focusing right now on some of the um, strains of apples and hardiness of apples and so we've got our on-site orchard. We also have a community gardens area where we work with community ed where people come in and help uh, grow some stuff there and learn that and we've actually worked with Lakewood Health Systems on their Choose Health program to bring families over from you know not necessarily always receiving fresh produce but able to produce their own with that so that area is growing tremendously and going there um, we have a lot of work going on in the area of how are we going to reduce our chemical use so we've got different chemical companies looking at different variations of that and trying to get into biologics on that how do we get natural controls we've got a tremendous amount of work going on environmentally about uh, nitrogen loss in the soils and how are we monitoring that and so we have what they call BMPs or best management practices and trying to perfect those so those are with the University of Minnesota and Department of Agriculture we now have uh, staff on site from the Department of Agriculture, uh, soil scientists and a nutrient management specialist. And so those folks are consistently in our area working with uh, groundwater and groundwater reserves. The other side is on the irrigation piece is to look at variable rate irrigating. Because again, we don't want to just put the same amount of water over this land. 
we can now break that up accordingly uh, in segments. And it, it's, it saves us obviously energy and, and water. Um, and how do we do that the best and make that the most efficient and try to get our plants to be the most efficient as we can across that. And there's you know other projects moving on with anything to do with soil health is really a big movement right now. Genetics, what we've done with genetics over the past number of years in America is tremendous, but the potential there isn't as strong anymore. It's in that biological, soil biological health will take us to the next level. So then we'll start seeing those three to 500 bushel corn yields when we get that wow. soil there. Um, Three to 500 yeah. bushels? Sure. Wow. Uh, yeah, we're peaking now. If you go to Central America, and I'm telling you, Central America to me is the I states, Illinois, Indiana, for them to hit that three to 400. And, and the yield winners are now hitting that 430 to 450. Wow, that's incredible. You know, so those aren't consistent, but that's where we're going. And you're still doing uh, field trials too, right? Absolutely, for, absolutely. For yep. corn and soybeans? Yep, we had just over part? 100 plots alone that were just in the trials. And again, the trials are basically comparison of genetics. Um, you know, because every seed that comes out has got its own set of traits, and so we're always looking at what are the best traits that work best, and how do we cross to get better at that. And of course, as you know, decisions are made for now the 2016 crop, as they're making them right now. Those trials are being used by the those that sell the seed as well as the producers, the farmers, um, for what the best results would be wow. next year. Absolutely. How technical it has become. Absolutely. It really yep. has. It has. So if someone's interested in uh, getting expertise from your organization or potential students, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, well, we have a presence on the web at eggcentric.org, or they can call the Central Lakes office where we're hosted there. Uh, they can basically, if they Google us online, it's easy to, to pick that up and do that. But certainly I welcome them to come in and if they wanted the tour. Uh, with that, we do have our project manager is out at a number of schools and different events. Uh, a couple of weeks we'll be down in the event called Robotics Alley, which is all about technology and agriculture. We're hosting that tract. Um, and so any place that they want to connect with us along the way. Uh, we try to be present at most and be involved with a lot of organizations, even legislatively, as we know uh, from the governor's perspective that the agriculture workforce is a priority to them and was pointed out last week at one of the conferences we were at. Wow, very, very, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to join us and uh, I feel overwhelmed. Oh. I, I had no idea that so many of these things were happening. Sure. So it's called Ag-Centric and uh, Central Lakes College, Center of Excellence, some terms we hope you remember. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow, so long until next time.